I'm really happy that Agatha and I got to speak here as, a, as youth activists because I know that we carry a not so diplomatic reputation. So <laughs> I hope to live up to that promise. <laughs> I, uh, I want to actually also start by thanking uh, Philippe for taking the lead on organizing this event. Because I know that what is perceived as radical changes with the individual context that we are in. And I find it radically brave and courageous of you and your colleagues to put this conversation forward here and set a new bar for this institution. I also want to acknowledge and thank all of the speakers, staff and participants who made this event possible because I've seen incredible people that have proposed radical ways forward. And I know that some of you have fought for these ideas for decades and I can only imagine how special it is for them to share it in a space like this. So thank you for taking the lead on mainstreaming a conversation on degrowth beyond the stage of this hemicycle. What have we done here for the past three days? We are fundamentally rethinking the global economy because we must. Infinite growth on finite resources is not only a myth, but is extractivist and ruthlessly oppressive by design. In essence, it is a system of institutions which determine who wins and who loses in the game of life. So when talking about growth, and defending growth, there is a very important first question that we need to ask ourselves. Who are we growing this economy for? And what stories do we use to justify it? I'm going to say something that is unfortunately controversial to this institution, but it really shouldn't be. If we move beyond growth, we have to acknowledge what lays below our growth. White supremacy, colonialism and imperialism. And I, I really wanted to join Professor Sultana and the other speakers who made sure this is addressed. White supremacy justifies a global system of exploitation and extractivism. Colonialism lays at the foundations of the European economy, institutions, corporate value chains, trade deals, investment agreements, and geopolitical structures of wealth accumulation, which means that there is no degrowth without decolonization. In our current systems, our economies are growing for some of us on the backs of many of us. Not only must we see and speak the truth about this system, we also have to change it on every level. Talk about the dangerous systems of deadly growth everywhere with everyone and make sure that, they, that every conversation about climate change includes a conversation about its root causes. And that brings me to a second question. Who are we including in the conversations about growth? Some of the conversations we had here may seem radical for people who are only able to think within a system of infinite growth. And that's why we need to have these debates in a radically different way and move from panels to real dialogue. To some of the politicians that were on the stages these past days, I do invite you to switch places sometime and listen to the real concerns and anger of people in this room. We need to take these conversations outside of these rooms and make sure that for all of the hundreds of fossil fuel lobbyists demanding growth, there are thousands of us demanding degrowth.
Because if we don't manage to put these conversations into action, we end up debating another 50 years without fundamental and systemic changes. And we don't have that time. <laughs> we don't have that time. <laughs> we all agree. I often hear people tell me that change is complex and therefore slow. I disagree. I don't think change is complex. I think enacting change is simply about changing the stories we tell ourselves to make sense of the world. The idea of scarcity is artificial. The obsession with growth is artificial. And the whole concept of de development and whatever that means is artificial. And it's a really, really, really good thing that many of us are not buying it anymore. What we need is an economy that scales down everything that is harmful and unnecessary as soon as possible. And there's tons of empirical evidence that has established degrowth is fundamental to the remaining time and carbon budget we have to mitigate the climate crisis. But as Julia Steinberger noted yesterday, there is a massive disparity between the stories of scientists and the stories of policymakers. We are not talking about scientific or economic feasibility. We are talking about courage. European leaders, if you lack political bravery to make paradigm-shifting decisions, then leave it to us. Bring us into real decision-making spaces. Organize the People's Assembly and make your decisions in collaboration with the people affected by your policies. Understand that the leadership that got us into this crisis will not be the leadership that gets us out. We want a world of radical abundance, a world in which many worlds are possible, with an economy that serves our needs, a society that celebrates our differences inside a new paradigm that feeds our souls. We are fighting for freedom, not the superficial freedom to work in jobs we don't like, to sell things no one really wants. We fight for the deep freedom to build meaningful, meaningful lives without depending on growth. I was asked to end this intervention with a note on next steps. And I think that the necessary policy changes are very clear. We need to redistribute wealth, cancel climate debt, implement a universal basic income, massively invest in loss and damage funds, degrow the economy in high income countries, increase universal public services, reduce working time, dematerialize and reprioritize what it means to live a human life. As Europeans, that means we have to be humble and acknowledge that we don't actually have all the answers. We need to learn from the global majority where decolonial thought leadership has originally developed degrowth thinking. And as a movement, as movements, where do we go? We need to make sure the conversation doesn't end here. If you come from a movement or you belong to a movement right now and you commit to continuing this conversation beyond this conference, please, if you can, stand up. If you consider yourself an activist and you commit to continuing this conversation beyond this conference, please, stand up. And if you are a politician, a scientist, or anyone who commits to continuing this conversation beyond this conference, and I'm looking at my fellow panelists now, especially you, Philip, please stand up. I, I know that many of you have a lot more to say beyond what was said in this, uh, during the past three days. 
And I want to share this stage with some of my fellow activists by reading some of their key messages that were left out of the conversation. So I want to invite those who have a message to please show it to us. can read some of the messages that are on there, but to make it easy, I can voice some of the things that we can read on the boards. Growth kills lives. Stop the fossil fuel lobby. Dismantle patriarchal systems. That was one of my favorites too. Cancel debt. Land sovereignty now. And abolish Fortress Europe. This right here is the movement of movements that Naomi Klein talks about. And I want, the end, I want to end my speech with a quote from her. Only mass social movements can save us now. And if that happens, and we can build a movement of movements, well, it changes absolutely everything. The movements that she's talking about already exist, and they grow every day. We have little time, but we have many voices. And we will keep speaking until infinite economic growth is an old story from the past. Thank you.